Well, welcome. This is the first in our series of eight lectures on the Apostle Paul. I'm so excited to begin this journey with you. And it's my prayer that these lectures will be useful for you, not only in your public work as ministers of the gospel, but also in your personal walk as disciples of Jesus. Now, um, in your academic career, I'm sure you've taken some difficult courses. When I was in college, I had to take Calculus 3, and I can tell you that was a difficult subject. But this course that you're in right now has the distinction of being the only course that the Bible itself describes as difficult. So take a look at this passage from 2 Peter. So also our beloved brother Paul wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, speaking of this as he does in all his letters. There are some things in them hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do the other scriptures. All right, so even Peter admits that the letters of Paul can be hard to understand. And of course, it's even more difficult for us today, because unlike Peter, we stand at a distance of 2,000 years from Paul. Our world is so vastly different from the world that Paul lived in and the world that he wrote his letters in. And those differences can make it even easier for us to misunderstand what Paul meant. So it's appropriate that we begin in our first lecture by exploring Paul's world. We're going to be focusing on the Jewish and Greco-Roman backgrounds that inform our understanding of Paul. Now, you probably heard a popular saying that goes something like this. If you give a man a fish, you fed him for a day. But if you teach a man how to fish, then you fed him for his whole life. Well, in this lecture, I want to teach you how to fish. I want to give you tools that you can use for the rest of your life as you study Paul's letters and as you teach and preach them to the church. So we are going to be answering these three questions. First, what are the key sources that illuminate Paul's Jewish and Greco-Roman context? Two, how can these sources help me understand Paul? And here I'll provide five examples. And then finally, where can I go to explore these sources myself? All right, well, let's start then with our first question. What are the key sources that illuminate Paul's Jewish and Greco-Roman context? Now, before we look at those sources, let's orient ourselves historically by remembering a few key dates. So the Jews who returned from the exile rebuilt the temple in 515 BC. And this began a period that historians often refer to as Second Temple Judaism. In 323 BC, uh, Palestine was taken over by Alexander the Great as part of his world conquest. Then in 323 BC, Alexander died and his empire was split uh, among his generals. And Syria was controlled by the Seleucid dynasty. And after some time, the Seleucid dynasty gained control of Palestine. And one of the Seleucid rulers, Antiochus IV, attempted to uh, stamp out Judaism. In around 167 BC, he defiled the temple, he outlawed circumcision, and he tried to force the Jews to offer idolatrous sacrifices. And under the leadership of a priest named Mattathias and his five sons, the Jews revolted. And they won. And they uh, then enjoyed a period of about 100 years of independence. This period of independence came to an end in 63 BC when the Roman general Pompey marched into Jerusalem. And this began the period of Roman control of Palestine. This, of course, is the time when Jesus lived and when Christianity began. Jesus was crucified in about AD 30. And then in AD 66, the Jews revolted against the Romans. And unlike the Maccabean revolt, this revolt ended in disaster for the Jews. In AD 70, the Romans conquered Jerusalem and destroyed the temple. All right, well, now that we've reviewed our history, let's take a look at some of the key sources that we have for Second Temple Judaism. Now, this is not a comprehensive list here, but it does include some of the most important literary sources that we have available. Josephus was a Jewish historian who was born a few years after Jesus died. He was born in Jerusalem, and his writings are an extremely important source of information about the world of the New Testament. We're also fortunate to have many writings from Philo. Philo was a Jewish philosopher who lived in Alexandria, which was a city in Egypt. And the Septuagint uh, is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. And that was a project that began around 250 BC. We also have the Apocrypha and Pseudepigrapha. These are collections of ancient Jewish texts that were not included in the Hebrew Bible. And many of them were composed before AD 100. And so they 
provide an important source of information about Second Temple Judaism. The Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered in the late 1940s near Qumran, a settlement near the Dead Sea which was apparently occupied by a sectarian Jewish community that had pulled away from mainstream Judaism. And this settlement was destroyed in 8068 in the war with Rome. In addition to copies of books from the Hebrew Bible and the Apocrypha and the Pseudepigrapha, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls included many previously unknown texts which were apparently composed by the community at Qumran. And finally, we have the enormous corpus of Greek and Roman literature. Now, as I said before, this is not a comprehensive list of the primary sources available to us. In addition to these literary sources, we have a variety of other sources, including coins, inscriptions, and even business receipts. All right, well, now let's move on to our second question. How can these sources help me to understand Paul? I'm going to give a few examples here. I'll start with some relatively simple examples and move on to some more complex examples. Consider first Philippians 3. Uh, Paul writes, If anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. Circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is in the law, found blameless. So we could ask, what does Paul mean when he says, as to the law, a Pharisee? Well, if we look at our sources, we can learn quite a bit about who the Pharisees were. Josephus uh, describes the various sects in ancient Judaism, and he says the Pharisees are considered the most accurate interpreters of the law. Um, take a look also at this phrase, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church. Um, when we examine our sources, we find a strong tradition of zeal for the law in Second Temple Judaism that was sometimes associated with violence. So consider, for example, this passage from 1 Maccabees. 1 Maccabees is one of the books included in the Apocrypha, and it tells the story of the Maccabean Revolt. Um, in this passage, an officer from the Seleucid ruler Antiochus IV has come to a village where the priest Mattathias lives, and he has come to force the Jews in this village to offer pagan sacrifices. So we read, A Jew came forward in the sight of all to offer sacrifice. In other words, this Jew gave in to the pressure. When Mattathias saw it, he burned with zeal and his heart was stirred. He gave vent to righteous anger. He ran and killed him upon the altar. At the same time, he killed the king's officer who was forcing them to sacrifice, and he tore down the altar. Thus he burned with zeal for the law, as Phineas did against Zimri the son of Salu. Then Mattathias cried out in the city with a loud voice, saying, Let everyone who is zealous for the law and supports the covenant come out with me. And thus began the Maccabean revolt. So we see here that Mattathias burned with zeal for the law, like Phineas. And this is a reference to the story in Numbers 25, where a man named Phineas takes a spear and kills a fellow Israelite who is violating the law. Um, consider also this passage from Philo. Philo is here speaking of the man who swears a false oath and it invokes the Lord's name, but it does not keep the oath. And therefore we must declare that God, though his nature is to be merciful, will never free from guilt him who swears falsely to an injustice, a miscreant almost beyond possibility of purification, even if he obeys the chastisements of men. And these he will never escape, for there are thousands who have their eyes upon him, full of zeal for the laws, strictest guardians of the ancestral institutions, merciless to those who do anything to subvert them. So Philo seems to be saying here that even in his day, there are thousands of people among the Jews who are full of zeal for the law and who are merciless to those who subvert them. All right, so with the phrase, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, Paul seems to indicate that prior to his encounter with Jesus, he was in this tradition of, of zeal for the law that was even associated with violence. He went so far as to persecute the church. All right, well, moving on to our next example here from 1 Corinthians 1. Paul writes, For indeed Jews ask for signs and Greeks search for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, to Jews a stumbling block and to Gentiles foolishness. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Now, remember here that the word Christ means Messiah. So we preach Messiah crucified, to Jews a stumbling block. Well, we may ask, why is Messiah crucified a stumbling block for the Jews? Well, if we turn to our sources, we can learn a good bit about what uh, Jews in the Second Temple period were expecting from their Messiah. 
Um, here's an example from Psalms of Solomon. Uh, now, this, these Psalms were not actually written by Solomon. They were written uh, in probably in the first century BC after uh, Rome had taken over Palestine. And in this passage, the psalmist writes of the coming Messiah. Raise up for them their king, the son of David, to rule over your servant Israel in the time known to you, O God. Undergird him with strength. To do what? To destroy the unrighteous rulers, to purge Jerusalem from Gentiles who trample her to destruction, in wisdom and in righteousness to drive out the sinners from the inheritance, to smash the arrogance of sinners like a potter's jar, to shatter all their substance with an iron rod, to destroy the unlawful nations with the word of his mouth. So the Messiah is expected to destroy the unrighteous rulers and to drive out the Gentile occupiers. The Messiah is certainly not expected to be crucified by the Romans. That's precisely the opposite of what the Messiah is expected to do. So we can see that the idea of a crucified Messiah would have sounded very strange to um, the Jews in Paul's day. What about this line as to Gentiles' foolishness? Well, of course, crucifixion was a terribly humiliating uh, way to die. Um, Cicero describes crucifixion in this way. But Cicero is a Roman uh, Roman author, and he writes uh, of crucifixion uh, as the worst extreme of the tortures inflicted on slaves. So it's a humili humiliating death associated with slaves. It is not the sort of death that one would expect uh, the Son of God to, to experience. All right, let's move on to our third example. This one's a fun one um, from 1 Corinthians 10. Paul here is writing of the children of Israel as they have come out of Egypt in the Exodus and are uh, wandering through the wilderness. Paul writes, I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink for they were drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them and the rock was Christ. Now, um, you may ask here, why, why does Paul say that the rock followed them? There's no hint in the Old Testament of the rock following uh, the Israelites as they went through the wilderness. Well, if we look at our sources, we find that there is this tradition of a well of water following the Israelites through the wilderness. Take a look, for example, at this passage from Pseudophilo. By the way, the name Pseudophilo means that this text was passed down under the name of Philo, but it wasn't really written by Philo, so we refer to it now as Pseudophilo. But we read, God brought forth a well of water to follow them, and it followed them in the wilderness forty years, and it went up to the mountain with them and went down into the plains. So apparently Paul is familiar with this tradition of the, the well of water following the Israelites. All right, now this fourth example here is one that I particularly like. Um, this is from Romans 9. Paul writes, And not only this, but there was Rebecca also, when she had conceived twins by one man, our father Isaac. For though the twins were not yet born and had not done anything good or bad, in order that God's purpose according to his choice might stand, not because of works, but because of him who calls, it was said to her, the older will serve the younger, just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. So Paul says here that God's choice of Jacob over Esau was made before the boys had done anything good or bad, and thus the choice was not based on works. Well, we might think, Today, well, yeah, that's, that's pretty obvious uh, from the story. But as we look at our sources, we come to realize that Paul, in making this argument, is actually pushing back against another interpretation of Genesis, which was apparently uh, popular in his day. So take a look at this passage from Jubilees. Now, Jubilees is one of the books included in the Pseudepigrapha, and um, it contains uh, imaginative, expansive retelling of the patriarchal narratives. From Genesis. And um, at one point, the author says this, For the Lord did not draw Ishmael and his sons and his brothers and Esau near to himself, and he did not elect them because they are the sons of Abraham, for he knew them. So we see here that the author of Jubilees is dealing with the same issue that Paul is dealing with in Romans 9. Both Isaac and Ishmael are children of Abraham, but only Isaac is chosen. Both Jacob and Esau are children of Isaac, but only Jacob is chosen. Why is that? Well, the answer that the author of Jubilees gives is that God knew them. In other words, God knew their character. He knew the kind of men they would become. He knew what deeds they would do. And this becomes very clear as the narrative of Jubilees progresses. We see that Jacob is a good, righteous person, 
but Esau is a wicked person. Uh, consider, for example, this passage that occurs towards the end of the narrative. Now, if you remember in Genesis, we read that um, Isaac liked, uh, Isaac loved Esau and Rebekah loved Jacob. Well, in Jubilees, we're told that eventually Isaac comes around and realizes, oh yeah, Jacob is actually the better son. I should have, I should have loved him. So Rebecca says to Isaac, she says, you know Esau's inclination that it has been evil since his youth and there is no goodness in him. He is bitter against you because you blessed Jacob, your perfect and upright son, because he has no evil but only goodness. It's a little over the top, isn't it? Uh, Esau has been evil since his youth, but Jacob is the perfect and upright son. No evil, only goodness. Well, Isaac replies, I know and see the deeds of Jacob. I first loved Esau more than Jacob because he was born first, but now I have loved Jacob more than Esau because he has increasingly made his deeds evil. And he has no righteousness because all of his ways are injustice and violence. All right, so it's clear here that according to the author of Jubilees, God made the right choice. He chose Jacob over Esau because he knew that Jacob was the better son. Um, he was the better man. We see this in other texts as well. Uh, Pseudophilo says it quite clearly. And God loved Jacob, but he hated Esau because of his deeds. So, no, this is the same passage that Paul quotes. God loved Jacob, but he hated Esau. But the answer that Pseudophilo gives, as, as far as the reason for this, is precisely the opposite of the answer that Paul gives. Paul says it was not because of works. Pseudophilo says it, it was. We see this also in Philo. Um, Philo writes, of Jacob and Esau, when still in the womb, God declares that the one is a ruler and leader and master, but that Esau is a subject and a slave. Why? For God, the maker of living beings, knoweth well the different pieces of his own handiwork, even before he has thoroughly chiseled and consummated them, and the faculties which they are to display at a later time, in a word, their deeds and experiences. So again, we have this idea, just in, like in Jubilees, God chose Jacob over Esau because he knew them. He knew what sort of men they'd be, what sort of deeds they would they would do all right well i've got a, a lot i'd like to say about romans 9 i'm going to devote the majority of a later lecture to that chapter um, but at this point we'll just say that um, when paul argues that god's choice of jacob over esau was not based on works it was made before they had done anything good or bad we can see that paul is pushing back against what was evidently a a popular interpretation um, in his day all right, now our final example is quite complex and rather speculative. Um, I've saved it for last because it's the most difficult. Um, take a look at what Paul says in Romans 10. For Moses writes that the man who practices the righteousness which is based on law shall live by that righteousness. But the righteousness based on faith speaks thus. Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is, the word of faith which we are preaching. That if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Now it's clear that Paul is quoting Deuteronomy 30, but the way that he uses this passage in his argument is just bewildering. Um, take a look at the passage in its original context. Okay, so here's Deuteronomy 30. Uh, this is at the end of Deuteronomy, and Moses is exhorting the people to obey the laws which he has given them, um, the laws which are recorded in Deuteronomy. And Moses tells them that if they obey God's commands, they will experience his rich blessing, but if they disobey, they will experience his judgment. Um, so here's what, what we read. Then the Lord your God will prosper you abundantly if you obey the Lord your God and keep his commandments and his statutes which are written in this book of the law. For this commandment which I command you today is not too difficult for you, nor is it out of reach. It is not in heaven that you should say, who will go up to heaven for us to get it for us and make us hear it that we may observe it? Nor is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will cross the sea for us to get it for us and make us hear it that we may observe it? But the word is very near you, in your mouth and in your heart, that you may observe it. In Deuteronomy, the word, which is near in the mouth and in the heart, that word is the law, the commands that God has given the people to obey. But according to the to Paul, when he uses this passage in Romans 10, the, the word is presented in contrast to the righteousness which is based on the law. So what in the world is Paul doing here? At first glance, it seems that Paul is just casting about for any language from the Bible that he can utilize to support his argument. 
and he's just ripping that language from the pages of the Old Testament without giving any regard to the original meaning of, of uh, the passage. At best, it seems careless, and at worst, it, it seems downright deceptive. It seems like Paul is intentionally twisting the words of Scripture to say something that they were obviously never in, uh, intended to say. All right, well, wh what do we make of all this? Well, if we, if we look a bit closer at this, we can see that Paul makes an interesting change when he quotes Deuteronomy. I'm going to put them both up here on the screen, and you can see I've underlined the difference here. In Deuteronomy, we read, who will cross the sea? But when Paul quotes that, he says, who will descend into the abyss? Um, now, why does Paul make this change? Well, some scholars have noted that the contrast between heaven and the abyss is found in text in which God's wisdom is personified. So here is an example from Sirach. This is uh, another book from the Apocrypha. And we read, Wisdom will praise herself and will glory in the midst of her people. In the assembly of the Most High she will open her mouth, and in the presence of his, of his host she will glory. I came forth from the mouth of the Most High and covered the earth like a mist. I dwelt in high places, and my throne was in a pillar of cloud. Alone I have made the circuit of the vault of heaven and have walked in the depths of the abyss. So there's a contrast here between heaven and the abyss. So some scholars have argued that maybe that by... in Make, uh, making this change here, Paul is, we can tell that Paul is thinking about this idea of God's wisdom. Okay, well, wh why is that significant? Well, take a look at this very fascinating passage from Baruch. This is another book from the Apocrypha. And uh, notice that the author appears to be, like Paul, using the language of Deuteronomy 30. Uh, he appears to be alluding to this same passage. But now he's talking about wisdom. Um, he says, Who has gone up into heaven and taken her and brought her down from the clouds? Who has gone over the sea and found her and will buy her for pure gold? He goes on to say, though, God gave her to Jacob, his servant, and to Israel, whom he loved. Afterwards, she appeared upon the earth and lived among men. She is the book of the commandments of God and the law that endures forever. So um, the author of Baruch is using this language um, from Deuteronomy 30 to describe the inaccessible wisdom of God. Um, uh, but God, this, this wisdom of God that is so high above us, has come down to earth um, and has lived among men. How? In the law. The, the law is, is the manifestation of God's wisdom. Well, it seems like maybe what's happening here is that Paul is thinking along these same lines. But of course, for Paul... The wisdom of God is a person. It's, it's Jesus. Uh, Jesus is, is God's wisdom. Um, he really did live upon, uh, you know, um, appear upon the earth and live among men. Um, Jesus is the wisdom of God. So what, what may be going on here is that in Romans 10, it's not that Paul is just randomly casting around for language to support his argument, but rather what we see here is that Paul's reading of Scripture has been radically transformed by his Christology. And it's because of his conviction that, that Jesus is the wisdom of God that he is now able to read uh, this text in Deuteronomy 30 uh, as a, a proclamation of the word being made brought near to us, um, which Paul sees now is the message of Jesus that he's proclaiming. All right? So, uh, again, this is, this is a, a rather complex example and, and, and rather speculative, but we see how... Um, these uh, additional sources that, that shed light on how, uh, what people were thinking in Second Temple Judaism, how they were reading the Bible, um, this can help us understand uh, what Paul is doing in his letters. All right, well, um, that concludes our examples. So now we're going to go to our final question here. Where can I go to explore these sources myself? We're going to get very practical. Now, as you hopefully know by now, there is a research project due at the end of this course. And so I hope that this will be something that's very helpful for you. Um, you know, we, the project is not due for, for eight weeks, but um, hopefully that even now you're starting to think about what topic you might want to explore and you're starting to think about, you know, what, what thesis you might want to argue in your research paper. So um, here are some links that uh, you can use to get to these sources that we've been discussing. So I'm going to have to exit the uh, presentation here so I can click on these links and, and um, show you how to use these sources. Okay, 
So the LCL here, uh, that uh, it stands for the Low Classical Library. And that requires a subscription, but fortunately we have a subscription through iWoo's library. So to get there, all you have to do is click on this link here, and that takes you to a page on the library's website. And if you scroll down to the bottom, you'll see Loeb Classical Library here. You click on that, and you, uh, you're in now with a, the full subscription. So if you click on Advanced Search, I'll show you how you can um, look through the library here. Uh, you can search by different fields. Uh, I know that's very small and hard to read, but uh, we can select author here for the first field. And uh, um, the Loeb Classical Library has Josephus, it has Philo, it has um, a lot of Greek and Roman literature, and it also has uh, some of the church fathers. So let's, um, let's, look, uh, let's look at uh, Philo. Now, Paul talks a lot about Adam, so maybe you're interested in exploring what Jews in Paul's day thought about Adam. Let's see if maybe this can shed some light on how Paul understood Adam. So we'll search here, uh, author, Philo, main text, Adam. And that will give us all of the passages in Philo in which he mentions Adam. So here we go, we get 14 results, 14 passages from Philo where he mentions Adam, so you can look through those. So that's the Loeb Classical Library. Um, you'll see I've also included links for Josephus and Philo to some older translations that are in the public domain. Um, I'll show you that here. Um, that, those links take you to this page, the Early Jewish Writings page, and someone here has just collected links to a lot of public domain translations, so this is a useful site here. Um, you can see down here at the bottom we have Philo of Alexandria. Um, these are his works, and Josephus, uh, his works here. All right, um, the Septuagint, uh, the best translation for that is the Nets, the New English Translation of the Septuagint. That was published uh, fairly recently by Oxford, and fortunately it is available online. Uh, this web page that I've linked to has PDFs uh, for all the books in the Nets. Um, I also have a link here to an older translation uh, by Brenton, which is in the public domain. Uh, that's available on Bible Hub, so... You can use that too if you would like, but again, the Nets translation is the most recent, that's preferred. For the Apocrypha, um, you can use the RSV, the Revised Standard Version, or the King James Version if you, if you prefer that. Um, I've included a link again to the Early Jewish Writings page, and uh, the Apocrypha here is, is listed under the title Deuterocanon. That's another word that's sometimes used to refer to the Apocrypha. But if you click on these, these books from the Apocrypha, it'll take you to a page with links to both the King James Version and the Revised Standard Version. Um, so that's the Apocrypha. And then also, of course, the Apocrypha. Uh, uh, so the distinction between Apocrypha and Pseudepigrapha is, is rather arbitrary. Uh, but a, a simple way, that's, it's not precisely accurate, but generally accurate, is that the Apocrypha refers to those books that are also included in the Septuagint. In, in the Greek version of the Old Testament. So um, the books from the Apocrypha can also be found in Nets, the New English translation of the Septuagint. All right, now the Pseudepigrapha, it's a bit more difficult to access. The best translation is this two-volume work from Charlesworth, but that unfortunately is only available in print. Uh, but there are uh, some older translations which are available on this uh, website, the Early Jewish Writings website. So. That's down here, Pseudepigrapha. You can see there are quite a few books listed here. All right, now the Dead Sea Scrolls, those are also a bit more difficult to access, but fortunately, um, the translation by Garcia Martinez, which is a very good recent translation, is available uh, through our library as an ebook. So if you click um, on this link here, I just link to the library page and I'll show you how you can find it. We'll just um, we'll put, type in Martinez and Dead Sea scrolls and um, that should come up as one of our results it may take a moment here to load all right so if you scroll down here this is the it's the Dead Sea Scroll Study Edition and you can click on the PDF here and uh, I'll just show you real quick you probably know this already but you can search within the book by clicking search within here and so say we were to, to look up uh, everything that's said about Adam, we could just type in Adam here. And we get all the passages where Adam is mentioned. 
Okay, so that's the Dead Sea Scrolls, um, and then the Greco-Roman literature that, as I mentioned, that's available on the Loeb Classical Library. Finally, I want to mention that if you have um, facility with the original languages, there are two resources that you should know about. Uh, one is Bible software packages like Accordance and Logos. Um, you can get these uh, texts that we've been discussing, you can get those um, on those packages. Also, TLG is an online corpus of virtually all extant Greek literature, um, and it's a, a, it has a search engine that you can um, use to search uh, for various Greek constructions, and it's a, a very powerful tool for advanced research. Unfortunately, both of those options are rather expensive, um, but I just wanted to make you aware of those if you weren't already. All right, well, that, that wraps it up for today's lecture. I look forward to interacting with you in the discussion forum. Uh, thank you for your attention. Have a great day.